Ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends, it's a pleasure to see you all here this evening. Thank you for coming so much. My talk this evening is the profit motive in education. You remember, I agree with Nick, those heady days when uh, everyone was agreeing with Nick on those television debates before the last election. Well, Nick, now of course Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg, recently gave a speech of relevance to our talk and our subject this evening. The speech was uh, about education and he said to anyone who is worried that we are inching towards inserting the profit motive into our school system, let me reassure you, yes to greater diversity, yes to more choice for parents, but no to running schools for profit. Well, you'd be maybe interested to know that I disagree with Nick. <laughs> and tonight I shall tell you a little bit of why I disagree. But really, the seminal influence on all my work has been Professor Edwin G George West. And really, I'll be talking about his work a, a great deal this evening and how it fits into this title. Because in some way, the, the title was given to me, The Profit Motive. But in some ways, I believe profit is actually a red herring in this debate. It's a distraction. It's not actually the issue we, we should be focusing on. Why is it a red herring? Because the issue, I believe, is freedom of education. Freedom of education. And when you think of comparable freedoms, freedom of association or freedom of speech, then you don't then worry about the profit motive or any other motive coming into these freedoms. Freedom of association, for instance. No one is there worried. This is a fundamental freedom, but we're worried about profit of bus companies or train companies or publicans or cafe owners or bicycle manufacturers, all of who, in a sense, profit from freedom of association our ability to move about and be with who we want to be. Similarly, freedom of speech. No one worries about the profits of this badge or button maker, that this is somehow detracting from the freedoms that we, we, we take for granted. And the same, I believe, is true for freedom in education. Now, I will come back to the profit motive towards the latter part of my talk. But really I want to focus first on this idea of freedom in education and why the freedoms that we may seek in education are in peril and have been for some time. And of course this brings us back to Edwin George West, born 27th of February 1922 in, in Yorkshire, uh, the, the son of a, of a cinema owner. His family moved south to Exeter, and uh, after leaving school at a, a fairly early age, Eddie worked for a variety of, um, a, a, a variety of companies, including a stint as a bus conductor, and later did his master's and his PhD in economics part-time through distance education, and became a lecturer in economics at Newcastle University, where in 1965 he wrote the book Education and the State, which has already been alluded to by Mark, is, was the seminal work of the 20th century, is the work that addresses fundamentally the issues that we are concerned with, the issues of educational freedom. The book had an extraordinary impact back in 1965. It really polarized opinions. On the one hand, you had the Sunday Times, this is perhaps the most important work written uh, on the subject this century. Dr. West, by turning orthodox uh, doctrine inside out, has affected a Copernican revolution. But on the other hand, there were criticisms. The teacher said, this is a polemic from Dr. West's stagnant little back academic backwater. The Times literary supplement was perhaps even less uh, forgiving. West gave the impression of an ill-tempered Chesterton on an off night. But the worst was in the New Statesman. The worst review is in the, st the New Statesman. There we can see West really ruffling feathers, where Chelly Halsey, the prof his emeritus professor of 
Nuffield College, Oxford, said, of all the verbal rubbish scattered about by the Institute of Economic Affairs, this book is so far the most pernicious, a gross distortion of the role of the state in education, choices between beer and Skittles, that's obviously alluding to John Stuart Mill's work, choices between beer and Skittles may well be left to the market, but education and the search for equality through education is too serious a matter to be left to an irrelevant and economic doctrine, and least of all, this is the cutting remark to Eddie, at least of all to its less competent practitioners. Now, Eddie was pretty upset by this, and uh, those of you who remember the IEA at the time will remember the IEA was pretty upset by this, and uh, they took the new statesman to court for libel. And uh, showing the, the touching innocence of the times, I was think, they, they settled for an apology, and uh, just the, the expenses of the court case. Uh, in, on the High Court on 26th July 1966, the new statesman, whose editor, of course, at the time was Paul Johnson, this was in his, his socialist days, Paul Johnson gave an unreserved apology for its unjustified attack on Dr. West and the IEA. Its review, it said, gave a totally misleading impression of West's arguments. Eddie was at, by this time, had moved to the University of Kent, and Charles Rowley, an American professor in Ewan Well, told the story of how he was walking down the corridor in the lecture halls there at Kent University, and he heard a terrible noise coming from one of the lecture theatres, and he went in and found Eddie West trying to lecture to his students. And remember this is 1966, 1965, heady times, university occupations, uh, all the rest of it, and the students had all taken off their shoes and were banging on the desk, sort of Che Guevara style, in protest about this, uh, this uh, right-wing lecturer trying to uh, tell them about Adam Smith and so on. Eddie then moved to, to Carleton University and became professor there where he was much happier. But what was it about? What was so dangerous, if you like? What was so revolutionary about education and the state? Really, it was a fundamental challenge to the orthodoxy that you need the state to be involved in education. What Eddie was doing, in a way, here's this table, if you like, where you've got the various ways in which the state can be involved in education through funding, through regulation, through provision. And Eddie's life's work, if you like, was to think how to fill in that table. And um, Mark mentioned that maybe I've been influenced by Eddie and my life's work has also been thinking how to fill in that table. And after this combined effort of many, at least two life's work, we, I guess Eddie came up with this and I came up with this too. This is the justified, these are the justified roles for the state in education in terms of funding, <coughs> regulation, and provision. Now, that's pretty radical. That's pretty upsetting to the status quo. And that was really what was the cause of Eddie's, uh, the, the reception of education and the state. Remember Chelly Holsey mentioned about equality of opportunity. And what I want to do for a little bit now is talk about what are some of the justifications for state education, that is for overriding the freedom of education, freedom in education. And remember, I'm coming to the profit motive through these ideas on educational freedom. What are the justifications that are usually given? And I would say in academic circles today, people would agree with Chelly, and they might put it in different terms now, but they would say you need the state in education in order to ensure either universal access or at least that the most disadvantaged in society can have access to education. This is, this is the most fundamental reason. There are others, and uh, please, I, you know, Eddie has written books about this, I've written books about this, I don't have time to cover others this evening, but this is the one I want to at least briefly address this evening. What are the justifications, and how does this justification stand water? And West's contribution really was to look at the history, the historical evidence on this major issue. And what he did was really, he, he uncovered what he called a paradox. Here then, we have the paradox of, public, of a public managing to educate itself into literary competence 
from personal motives and private resources, despite the obstacle of an institution called government, which eventually begins to claim most of the credit for the educational success. That was the paradox he set out. And he went to historical evidence to explore this. First of all, he showed, perhaps it's a paradox in five acts. First of all, he showed act one, government hindrance. He documented how even up until the middle of the 19th century, government's acts towards education were often about hindering literacy, explicitly or implicitly through these various taxes, advertising duties, stamp taxes, excise duties, through these various taxes to inhibit the literacy of the masses because throughout that period, government was slightly afraid of the literacy of, ma of the masses, that they may well uh, read seditious literature, which would have a bad effect on government. So Act 1 was government hindrance. Then Act 2, you could say, was the people's demand for education. And this is where Eddie really went to town in bringing this evidence, old evidence, to a new audience. He showed that through the private sector, through philanthropy, through churches, through low-cost private schools, the people, the poor, the masses in England, and he also showed it for Scotland, he showed it for New South Wales, he showed it for New York and Massachusetts, the people were finding ways of educating themselves. He quotes, he, he, he pointed us to James Mill, 1813, who wrote, um, from observation and inquiry, we can ourselves speak decidedly as to the rapid progress which the love of education is making among the lower orders in England. Even around London, in a circle of 50 miles radius, there is hardly a village that is not something of a school and not many children of either sex who are not taught reading and writing. Eddie West, and this remember, was 57 years before the 1870 Act, which was government's first major intervention in education. John Stuart Mill in 1834, uh, James, Stuart's, James Mill's son, of course, John Stuart Mill, said, as far, therefore, as the quantity of teaching is concerned, the education of our people is or will speedily be amply provided for. Eddie pointed us to Henry Brougham, Lord Brougham, speaking in the House of Lords in 1835, saying, there are such a number of schools and such means of education furnished by the parents themselves from their own earnings. It behoves us, he warned the House of Lords, who were debating possibilities of getting involved in education at this stage. It behoves us to take the greatest care how we interfere with the system which prospers so well of itself. That was the warning that was given back in 1835 Eddie documented these and other pieces of evidence. And then we had, this is really where Nick Clegg should start taking notice, perhaps. William Ewart Gladstone, speaking in uh, 1856, which historians will correct me, which I think was just a couple of years or a year or two before the foundation of the Liberal Party. But Gladstone, by this time, had left the Tories. He had uh, become uh, with the Peelite, joining with the Whigs, so they hadn't quite formed the Liberal Party, but they were almost there in the Liberal Party. And William Ewart Gladstone again, in a debate about whether the state and what form the state should intervene in education, he said, it appears to me clear that the day you sanction compulsory rating, in other words, funding schools through the rate system for the purpose of education, you sign the death warrant of voluntary exertions. Are we preparing to undergo the risk of extinguishing that vast amount of voluntary effort which now exists throughout the country. What does it sound like? When I read this, I, I thought this sounds very much like the big society. The big society that was existing there prior to the state getting involved in education. When some of us hear about David Cameron and the big society and the admonishment of the pub public for not getting involved so much, I think we should, we should reflect on this that actually the big society was there delivering educational opportunities before the state got involved and maybe the state pushed it out. And then finally, the evidence that really Eddie went to town on was the, the work of the Newcastle Commission, which did a, 
A really exhaustive research around the country in 1858, reported in 1861. This exhaustive research suggested that only 4.5% of children of school age were not in school. And the average school age was 5.7 years. These children were in schools, in church schools, in philanthropic schools, and also in these low-cost private schools, they're called the Dame schools. And Eddie described this evidence in a memorable, memorable phrase. He said that the state got involved in education, the state getting involved in education was like the state jumping into the saddle of a horse that was already galloping. The horse was already galloping, the provision was there, the state did not have to get involved in order to provide universal education, but Act 3 of this tragedy, this paradox in five acts, was government education, but it was explicitly, absolutely explicitly designed only to fill in the gaps in state provision, in private provision. Explicitly, um, William Forster said, in, it, it, as he presented the bill to the House of Commons, it was to fill in the gaps and we must take care not to destroy in building up, not to destroy the existing system in introducing a new one. Absolutely, they were aware of the difficult, aware of the dangers. The proposal was to create boards which would look for gaps in the private and voluntary provision and then propose possible board schools, new schools, to fill in those gaps. Nothing more was uh, involved in that. Act 4, Eddie then describes how this kind of intervention led to the crowding out of private provision and private finance. He did some very interesting calculations looking at how the, the, the proportion of the national income which was spent on education and he suggested from his calculations, this was only on day schooling, so this excluded night evening classes, Sunday schools and all the rest, but he suggested that before, in 1833, before the state got involved in any way in education, there was around 0.8% of national income spent on uh, children under 11 years in terms of their education. The figure went down considerably in 1920 and was only matched again he reckoned in 1965, and of course we're, they were living in a much richer time in those years. In other words, the provision, the public provision was crowding out private expenditure. And then even, this was recognised in fact by the Newcastle Commission itself, which pointed to the complaint that the government grants, even before 1870, the government grants enables the subsidised schools to undersell and so ruin them, these, the low-cost private schools and, and others. It's very common amongst the teachers, the Newcastle report re reported. And in fact, Eddie addressed this with a number of, uh, he, he found old letters, for example, from the rector of St. Paul's, Hume, to the Manchester School Board. And the rector was pointing out that in his school, his church school, as it happened, Parents could afford to pay sixpence or sevenpence per week. There was no problem, he said. In the, in the adjoining neighbourhood, parents were even poorer and they could afford seven or eight pence a week. There was no problem with parents not being able to afford their schooling. And yet, he said, the board, board schools are being set up in direct competition to his school. The board schools are much cheaper, if not free, and he is losing students to those schools. And his letter was actually in response to the fact that the, in, the inspectors were now saying his school, his school was of a low quality. And Eddie pursues this and says, well, this is an extraordinary crowding out, isn't it? First of all, the government sets up competing schools which are going to be cheaper than what you're running yourself. And then when you lose pupils and so you lose your best staff and so on, then the government says your quality is too low and you must be closed down. This was what was happening there as the the state that crowded out private provision. And then Act 5, which Eddie really explores in detail, is the government takes credit for that universal education. Um, 
turn to any, almost any source on the history of education now. Amartya Sen, for example, um, Nobel laureate in economics, um, wrote recently that uh, without the state in education, the developed world, America, Britain, Australia, they could not possibly have created universal education. So why are unnamed market proponents proposing that there should be market solutions for the developing world? And he is certainly not alone in proposing that. And then just down the road from here on the Victoria Embankment, there's this statue of William Forster, the architect of the 1870 Act. And you can read there on the stand, it says, to the, his wisdom and courage, England owes the establishment throughout the land of a national system of elementary education. But the work of E.G. West tells us that that system was already there. Only 4.5% of children were not in the schools before uh, Forster came in. And remember, Forster didn't want to change that. He only wanted to fill those gaps. But now we Lay, we praise him for his wisdom and courage in creating a nationalised system which is there throughout the land. Just very quickly, I've been talking here about England and we could talk about other countries too, but some people propose that Scotland is a counterexample to all this evidence. They propose that in Scotland, because Scotland got involved in very early, 16... Um, 96, the first parochial schools were established with some public subsidy in education. Because of that, the Scottish counterexample shows why we do need the state to get involved in education. And Eddie looked at this in detail and he came up with tables like this and figures like this, which shows, yes, in lowland Scotland, this was a source, the 1818 digest of statistics for lowland Scotland, the parochial schools were serving some children, but only 34% of the school-going population. The majority of children were in the private adventure or unaided schools that were set up because the rest of the schools, the public provision, and even the public provision only featured some subsidy of buildings, teachers, salaries were still paid for mainly out of student fees. This, the public provision was failing to cope with the demand, particularly from the masses, and that demand was being met, as Eddie West said in this quote here, by the private sector. So we've looked at freedom in education and suggested that that argument against educational freedom, for why we need the state to come into education, that we need the state in order to provide for the universal education and provide for the most disadvantaged in society. I suggest the evidence from that Eddie West first brought to our attention in 1965, in recent years, shows that that argument is not the case at all. State ed education is not justified historically for the reasons that are often given. Is there any contemporary evidence? And many of you will know my work, so I'll just go through this very quickly. But it's worth saying in the context of this lecture that 11 years ago I was inspired to go into the slums in Hyderabad, India, because of my reading of Eddie West. Eddie had pointed out how there were these low-cost private schools and philanthropic schools in the slums of London, Manchester, and Newcastle. I wondered, given what I'd heard about the parlour state of government education in India, I wondered, could there be anything similar in the slums of India today? And so that was my explicit motivation. I went there thinking of what Eddie had found, and sure enough, I found low-cost private schools, just like the Dame schools of Victorian England, serving the poor in the slums of India. And I was fortunate to get a grant from the John Temperton Foundation, and my, our teams, we went to Nigeria, to this shanty town um, on stilts in the black waters of the Lagos Lagoon where we found private schools, low-cost private schools, charging a couple of dollars equivalent per month. We went to the coconut uh, groves of the Atlantic coast of Ghana where we found private schools charging a couple of dollars per month equivalent. We went to the slums of 
Nairobi in Kenya, this one Kibera, the slum made famous recently with the, uh, um, the constant gardener and other attention it's received from celebrities. We went there and we found a hundred low-cost private schools charging a couple of dollars per month serving the poor in those communities. And we went to rural China to possibly the most extreme places I've ever been to on this earth, to villages like this one here where threshing was going on as it has done for hundreds of, or thousands of years. And there we found a low-cost private school at the end of a two-day journey serving the poor. And the reality we found was just like Eddie had pointed out was there in Victorian England and Scotland, we found that the majority of children were going to, now I've switched something off here. Can I switch back on? Ah, brilliant. Um, I was trying to use a pointer, but I won't risk it. Um, the government children there in the slums of, uh, of Lagos, the children going to government schools are in a tiny minority. Three quarters or more of children in these poor areas are going to private schools. And these schools are outperforming the government schools. The red shows the mean scores in Delhi. We tested 24,000 children in uh, maths, English, and Hindi. The red shows the government schools. The blue, the unregistered private schools. And the yellow, the registered private schools. And they were doing it all for a fraction of the cost. So this has been a tremendous celebration, I think, of what's happening in uh, uh, we can celebrate what's happening there in Africa and in India and in China and other places, very much pointing to the strength of private enterprise and how it can serve the poor. And the majority of these schools, this is where we bring profit back, are for-profit schools run by proprietors, not by charities, not by churches, not by mosques, but run by proprietors seeking a profit. Meanwhile, We've got all that live activity in the private schools, in a government school. This was, I shot this in Sierra Leone a couple of weeks back, looking in the slums in Sierra Leone. The private schools were there. There was vibrant activity going on. The government school next door, the teachers were, as usual, on strike. And uh, I've shown you that photograph before. Some of you, you've seen that. That was when we took a BBC crew to uh, Makoko in the slums of Lagos, Nigeria, and uh, the BBC crew went into a first classroom in the government school, the state school, and the first teacher we found was fast asleep at his desk, and the children jumped up and welcomed us, and still the teacher slept. And I, I would not, not, not be showing this slide now, and I've not shown it many times, without the confidence that every time you go into a government school in these places, you get a similar, you, you see something similar, teachers asleep or absent or not paying attention to the children. So that's, that's the evidence from around the world, which I've summarized in the book, The Beautiful Tree. You mustn't judge a book by its cover, but I'm quite happy if you judge this one. I think the cover is rather beautiful, published by Penguin. Um, that's the evidence from around the world. But again, from a contemporary sense, you can show that that argument against educational freedom, the argument for state intervention, is not justified on account of serving the poor or even providing education for all. But I was speaking recently to um, Madison Peary of the Adam Smith Institute, and he said, this is all very well, but the objection will be, can we guarantee, can we guarantee that this private provision will lead to universal access or improved access for the less privileged? And I guess the simple answer is no, we can't. But neither can you with a state education system. And neither can you for these facts and more. These are figures from, from England that truancy runs at nationally at 6.3% and it's 30% reported in some areas. Functional illiteracy and functional Innumeracy of 21-year-olds runs at around one child, one young person in five, having been through 12 or more years of compulsory education in this country, are still functionally illiterate. 
and functionally enumerate. So you can't guarantee under the state system that all will be served and all will be served well. Neither can you under a market system. But the arguments that I've tried to adduce so far and will continue to adduce and which I've written about suggest that actually there is something very valuable and, and something better about the market provision in, in, in providing for the poor and the most disadvantaged. Okay, in the last part of the talk then, let's return to this profit motive. And in a way, I said it's a red herring, I said the issue is educational freedom, but in a way, even that phrase itself highlights a problem with the way we frequently talk about profit. Because in that quote from Nick Clegg, he dwelt on the profit motive. Not the title of my talk, which is given to me, dwells on the profit motive. But surely the insights of Adam Smith, and again, E.G. West was an Adam Smith scholar, and I, Philip Booth recently said to me that uh, Adam, uh, uh, Eddie's introduction to Adam Smith is one of the finest on the market, still on the market. But going back to Adam Smith, surely we don't worry about the motive anymore. Adam Smith's fam famous quote, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of their, our own necessities, but of their own advantage, their self-love. That's the, that's the reality that we understand now about the economic motives. We understand that we don't have to look at motives anymore. What we care about are results. And this, I believe, is the important way we should consider profit, not the profit motive. The profit motive is a nasty motive. Of course it is. It's about striving for money. It's about all the things that are not our highest motives. It's not about benevolence. But what are the outcomes of people pursuing the profit motive. And here I've just listed a few of what I consider to be the advantages of profit, pursuing profit in education. Without the profit motive, you're not going to get the investment you need in education. You're not going to get the research and development in innovative new ways of teaching or of learning or of pursuing educational ideas. You're not going to get those new ways without the profit motive allowing investment and allowing a significant return to your investors to deliver what they are seeking. You're also not going to get the same growth in education. I remember reading Sir Michael Barber's work before he was knighted, when he was Tony Blair's right-hand man. And he was decrying when he was there in the, the delivery unit, as they used to call it, in, the, in number 10. He was decrying the way he saw really good innovations. I think this one was describing was in science. Really good innovations that were taking place in, in science, in one or two schools. And he was decrying that none of them was being replicated in any other schools. Why was this happening? If that was taking place in for-profit schools, that would not happen. If Innovations are working and improving outcomes, improving demand for those schools. Those innovations will be replicated and will spread like wildfire throughout the system. I've been working in India, as Mark mentioned earlier. I see that happen all the time in the schools I'm working with there, and the chain of schools I'm working in with in Ghana. We've tried a few innovations, and very quickly you see other people imitating those innovations. The profit motive leads to growth, it leads to imitation, it leads to inclusion. But I also want to reflect how it leads to real competition too. I put there exit, exit, exit. This is in a sense the mantra or the fear of anyone running a for-profit business, that your customers are going to exit. And that fear doesn't have to be there if you're in a non-profit or a state enterprise. In the worst, worst case scenario, if you're in a non-profit, I mean, if you're working in a non-profit, you might Worst case scenario, you lose your job, you might be able to 
I have to look for another career and another non-profit. If your for-profit business loses customers, you can lose your life savings. You can lose your whole raise and debt. Everything that you've put into it, you can lose. I see some people who are running education businesses nodding in the audience. That's the difference between the profit motive and how it keeps people on their toes over and above the non-profit and, and government motives. But the further advantage of profit, and this was, if you like, Hayek's insight that he left us, um, that the profit motive gives us the price mechanism and price and profits can act as signals, as information to entrepreneurs and investors about the ideas and the initiatives to, to move towards. These are, the price motive acts like that. Without the profit motive, who do we trust to make decisions about education allocation? Now I know, and there's a, these are caricatures agreed, and I'm sure you can find a good many men and women who are true to their beliefs in educational provision and the civil service and in politics who are really concerned about student performance, you know, they're just really concerned about education. But that's true in business too. I was speaking at Pearson last night. Pearson, the new learning, the global learning company. And there, that's a for-profit business, but the people were all very concerned with education. So you can find people in every walk of life who you might think are concerned. But without that profit motive, without the price mechanism, then you're left to politicians and civil servants to allocate resources to education. And there, as this quote um, it suggests, you, you have a one-size-fits-all one scenario. You have politicians pushing you in one direction rather than having a marketplace of ideas, a marketplace of opportunities which are tested against prices and profits so that the best argument, the best idea wins um, and, and, and resources are allocated that way more effectively. But it's not for me to say that, I'm not saying that the profit motive is a pure motive. But if you're considering the profit motive and looking for its disadvantages, then you've got to look for the disadvantages in the vote motive and you've got to look for the problems in the power motive, which are motives that inspire politicians and uh, civil servants. And I think we could probably paraphrase Sir Winston Churchill here. The profit motive, perhaps, is the worst of all motives, apart from everyone else that has ever been tried. It's a system made for human beings. It's a system made not for angels, but for real human beings. If the structures are right, then the profit motive can lead to beneficial outcomes. And it's those outcomes we should be concerned about, not the motive itself, which of course is something we don't want to praise. But the outcomes we do. I'm closing now. 10 years ago, Eddie died. Exactly 10 years to the day, Steve Jobs died. And his legacy, everyone says, is gonna be very, very profound. Um, he's also, his death also prompted many humorous takes, and I hope no one will be offended, but. I rather enjoyed this one. The uh, caption underneath, if you can't read it, uh, hmm, let's see, your name does ring a bell. As uh, St. Peter looks at his iPad for the name of the new arrival. But my suggestion is, yes, Steve Jobs' legacy is clear. But the legacy of Eddie West, Edwin George West, has been profound. His work in the 20th century illuminated the strengths of the private system in the 19th and has inspired work in the 21st century. His work inspired Milton Friedman in America, um, who actually changed his mind about vouchers um, in America based on his reading of Eddie's work and, ed and meetings with Eddie through the Mont Pelerin Society and other, uh, other bodies, including the IEA. His work has had a profound influence on everyone thinking about school choice around the world. And my suggestion is that with this memorial lecture we're inaugurating this evening, we are 
suggesting that his legacy will continue for some time and be incredibly important. So we're celebrating Eddie West. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for a, a fascinating and um, inspiring uh, lecture. Thank you so much. We've got about 20 minutes to take questions. Uh, I have the light in my eyes, but if you raise your hand uh, high in the air, I'll, I'll try and take some questions from the floor. We've got um, two or three people, I think, roving microphones. And if you could introduce yourself, please, say who you are and where you're from, if the second of those is relevant to the rest of the audience, that would be greatly appreciated. I'm going to try and take them in batches, so I'll start with the gentleman here, then there. First of all, I'd like to say I had the great fortune of being taught economics by Eddie West some 50 years ago. Um, that was a great fortune for me. I've I benefited ever since then. But I'd like to congratulate our lecturer tonight on a really inspiring talk. Um, the only problem we have is that our, none of our politicians seem to have the same wisdom as our speaker has tonight. Um, what can we do about that? <laughs> and over here. Can, can you say your names? Because I. Hi, like uh, Amrajit Pandya. Um, I lecture in the Law Department at the University of Durham. Um, I just wanted to sort of uh, ask an additional sort of thing, which I didn't see come out of the lecture, which is output. Um, in a seminal book called The Welfare State We're In, people, uh, so the analysis was that in fact when the state wasn't in education in the 19th century, literacy results were significantly higher than when the state um, did get involved. So I thought maybe you could shed some more light on that. And first mm -hmm. from this round, I think there was somebody here. Yes. Hi, my name is Cassie Burrissing, um, and I'm setting up a free school in the South London. And um, I'd like to ask, with the freedoms that you talk about, if freedoms were introduced into the state sector properly, so that free schools and academies were able to set their own curriculums and do what was necessary, if we had modes of entry so schools could spring up and give competition to existing schools, if we have modes of exit so that schools can be closed down, if union reform were to come about so that people could lose their jobs when they don't perform properly so that they have the fear that you talk about that uh, when you're running your own enterprise you feel. If all of those elements could be brought into the state sector, I wonder then what your argument would be for, for having profit. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. And thank you. I didn't get your, your name first of all. Patrick Evershire. Patrick, <laughs> of course, yes. Um, um, that word wisdom, thank you for uh, using it, but uh, of course the title of my talk, which I didn't, was actually Robert Motive Lessons for the British Government. I put a question mark there. That was the title given to me, and I, I didn't actually address that issue, did I, in the end? Because, I mean, what do you tell the British Government or any other government? You say, actually, um, it's clear you're not needed in education, you've been destructive in education, so uh, could you uh, <laughs> kindly, you know, here's the door, sort of thing. I mean, what, what are the lessons? And obviously, Catherine's question will, will touch on that. Um, some of the politicians must know this stuff, mustn't they? But I think maybe part of what, you know, what, a, what the IA keeps on doing and does very well indeed, and with other bodies, and maybe this new body that's been formed will do it with James Croft, um, we, we just got to keep on banging on this same old story. I mean, in a way, here I am tonight, and I think, should I mention those particular points or others? Surely my whole audience will know that. And obviously, I, I apologise if I did t tell anyone who knew already. But then you find Amartya Sen doesn't know it. You, know, you meet Amartya Sen and he says, well, without the state, there was no schooling. You know? and, and so, you know, we've just got to keep on that message. The work we're doing in developing countries, emerging economies, is, is fascinating in that way. I mean, I'm going to be keeping on about that for as long as I've got breath in my body. And uh, I think that's the only way we convince them. And then maybe, when we come back to Catherine's question, but um, Rajit from Durham, well, we must catch up sometime in the Northeast. Um, we must do that. I didn't know you were there. Um, yeah, James Bartholomew's brilliant book, The Welfare State We're In, 
does speak about output. I, I didn't talk about quality at all, deliberately in a way, um, when I was speaking about the historical evidence, because of course it's, it's hard to say you're comparing like with like. Uh, very hard. I mean, the, the evidence, and that was all from E.G. West that James, Bartholo James Bartholomew used in the book, and James Stanfield, my colleague, E.G. West Centre, helped with um, the collect collection of that data for James Bartholomew. Um, it, the data shows that, yes, literacy was probably as high or higher pre-state than after, but in the end, you know, people can always say, it's not, you know, how can you compare those? Even in terms of the quality of provision in Victorian England, this is perhaps the major objection to E.G. West's work. People will say, yes, but the quality was awful. Look at those inspectors' reports. And true enough, Her Majesty's inspectors in the 1860s, 1850s, were writing damning reports about these low-cost private schools. Um, they were saying they're full of untrained teachers who uh, um, and, and poor, poor quality buildings, and the children are Sometimes the inspectors wrote the children are learning to read seditious literature, the word I used before. That was from an inspector's report, H. S. Tremonier, I believe, in 1865. Um, so one can unpick, one can deconstruct the evidence from those inspectors and say, well, actually, maybe they're not addressing poor quality, but they're just showing their own prejudices. And what I feel excited about is the criticisms of the inspectors of 18, 19th century education in England are identical to the criticisms of the uh, development experts about low-cost private schools uh, in India, Africa, and China today. Identical. So when I'm speaking at greater length, I say, let's not dwell on the quality there. We don't know in Victorian times. Let's look at the quality now, and that's why I gave that one graph. There's lots of evidence to show that private, including for-profit private schools, are outperforming government schools. And we have data, too, from China showing the for-profit private, low-cost private schools are outperforming the community non-profit private schools. So there's lots of interesting data, um, but I, I didn't go, go to it. So, so Catherine, I, I liked what you said, because I counted, was it 19 ifs? No, there were a lot of if you can do this, if you can do that, if the other thing happens. Um, so that's the first big if, isn't it? I, you know, the problem with trying to reform the government set education is those ifs will probably not happen. You know, will you ever get the freedom to sack your teachers as there is freedom in the private sector? Will you ever get the freedom to close a school down if it's not doing well? I think the vested interest groups will always stop that. But anyway, you said, hypothetically, if you can get those through, would this, would this challenge my argument about for profit? Would, or where would it fit in? I mean, I think it would fit in very neatly, I would say, under those conditions, if your ifs were satisfied, then the profit motive could work much, much better than the non-profit motive. Now, you're going to open a school, you said. That's, that's terrific. And I know Toby Young has opened his one school in West London, hugely um, demanding on his time and energies, hugely sapping of his strength to go on, I, I, I read. And he says he's going to open 30 of those schools. I doubt he will. You'll stop at three, five schools, maybe. If there was your if satisfied, if the profit motive was there, you could get investors in who really wanted you to expand what you're delivering the children, what you're doing to improve their education. You could get investors on board who would really um, be, be, be behind you all the way, backing what you're doing, and you could expand much more easily. So I think the profit motive fits in very neatly with your ifs. But I'm not sure your Fs will be satisfied. Thank you. Let's look for uh, three more questions. And gentleman at the front there. And I'll take the lady on the side there. And um, then just a bit further back in the wire. So. Yes, David Brand. I work in IT. I'm interested in education for many years. Uh, before uh, the state became involved, education was entirely voluntary on the part of parents. It's now compulsory. Do you think it should be compulsory or not? Thank you. Um, then if we can take the side Hello, um, my name is Daisy Christodoulou. I'm a teacher in a state school in London. Um, thank you, I really enjoyed that speech. It was really inspiring at points. Um, I have a couple of questions about voluntary education in the Victorian era. So firstly, um, 
uh, there was some government funding of schools before 1870. Mm. Um, you know, not a national system, but the funding was significant. So I wonder how significant you think that was, because, mm. you know, before, eight, I think it was 1830, the first government act. 1833. 1833, yeah. 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 So, and that, I think, was quite significant. So how do you see that as, as being effective? And, and the other thing that's always convinced me of perhaps the need for, for government funding of education is the, the figure of Edward Baines. So Edward Baines was one of the most eloquent voluntarists of the Victorian era, but eventually came round to the uh, state funding case because he, he just felt that the, the, the funding and the money was needed. And uh, like I said, Edward Baines was you know, almost as eloquent as you perhaps in his statement of the voluntarist case. So uh, I wondered um, what you might say about those, those points. Hmm. Um, I'm David Thomas, I'm another uh, teacher at a state secondary school in London. Um, I just want to ask you about the secondary education, because it seems from your presentation that all the growth when the government got involved was pretty much in secondary education. And again, it seemed that it might just be coincidence, but all your slides show nursery and primary schools. Um, is there a risk, and it's this time to the first question we just asked about compulsory education, is there a risk that perhaps parents drop out when their children become literate, or that we don't get more advanced in education sort of as children grow up? Yeah, I mean, interesting questions. I'll take um, the first and last one together. Um, yeah, there were subsidies, small subsidies from 1833. Um, they didn't amount to a great deal until the latter, the, uh, the years immediately leading up to 1870, when the figures that Forster brought to Parliament were that there, a third of the funding by that stage was from uh, this, this public contribution to, to schooling. So the maximum was one third, um, but that was very, very late on. So initially it was, the subsidies were very tiny. And that one third, remember, came from taxes, and taxes at the time were incredibly regressive. The taxes were very heavy on tobacco and food, which would have hurt the working classes very heavily. And Eddie West uh, explores this issue, and he, he, he says no one has actually People argue that these funds are needed, even they were only a third of the income of education, day schooling totally. But no one has actually said if the taxes were not taken away from the poor, from the working classes, they would have had more money. Would they then have spent that more money on education anyway? No one has made a convincing case that that wouldn't have been the case. So yes, there was subsidy. It was minor, but it even if there is subsidy, it still doesn't answer the case whether it's necessary. Now, your, your description of Edward Baines, I'm, I'm really sorry, I didn't do my preparation well for this lecture, and I've, I've, I haven't got him, you know, to hand. But uh, what, what, uh, what one can say is many people became persuaded of the need for state education, and one can always, one can question their motives or look at their evidence. And... If we look at the evidence that I've put forward to you today that E.G. West um, puts forward so well in his work and others, and look at the criticisms, obviously, and try and understand what's going on there, I think the evidence would not lead you to change your mind. So I think if you were Edward Baines, somehow you got misled on the way there. Um, but that's, I apologise for the weakness of that response. But the first two questions, should... It was voluntary before the state, then it became compulsory. Should education be compulsory now? And would that, you know, would that problem lead to um, secondary schools not being provided? Incidentally, it was a, it was a uh, coincidence that my slides of developing countries that showed only primary and nursery schools. I think the first one actually might have showed a secondary school. Um, but private secondary provision is, is there, as well as primary and uh, nursery. Um, so that was a coincidence. Um, but I, I think... The, the answer, is com compulsory education necessary? No, it's not. Why is it not necessary? Because parents have desires for their children. It's the, one, of, one of the most strongest impulses one ever sees. You know, once you've fed your children, you've clothed your children, and you've provided shelter for them, the very next thing you want, I've seen it all over the world, from the slums of Hyderabad to the mountains in Gansu province, China, to the slums in Sierra Leone. Parents want to educate their children. Why do they want to educate their children? Because that's the way of helping them get a better living, sometimes 
to provide for you, your, the parent, yourself in older age, often because you want the best interest for your children. Parents want that. What the Newcastle Commission showed was that only 4.5% of parents were not, not uh, responding to that need in education. The state, remember, stepped in only for that tiny minority. Compulsion was not necessary then, and the arguments for it are clearly not valid if you look at them in detail. Would parents provide secondary education? In a poor society like Victorian England, may not, maybe not. In a society like ours, if there was this free market, and following Catherine now, if we had a market in education, if there was a profit motive allowed and so on, so that education could respond to the needs of the economy, the needs of democratic life, the needs of society, if all those things were satisfied, then of course you wouldn't need compulsion in order to um, have parents provide for the best possible education for the their children, including and up to secondary and higher education, if that was necessary in the society. So I'm absolutely against compulsory, well I don't say compulsory education, I say compulsory schooling, because I follow the philosopher R.S. Peters, who pointed out that compulsory education is an oxymoron. You cannot compel someone to be educated. You can possibly provide opportunities, but you cannot compel education, it's a voluntary acceptance or initiative. Um, so yeah. Compulsion is out. Okay, let's take a, a few more questions. Right at the back, uh, then just in front of you, and then this one on the aisle, just a few rows back. Julie. Hi there, this is uh, Julie Meyer, and that was a fantastic lecture. I guess I wanted to ask, to your knowledge, if uh, building on that whole question of how to change things, mm -hmm. and the idea of investing and getting a return, has any work ever been done to try to quantify the potential investment into profit-led schools. Because one way to change things would be to, to suggest that there exists, you know, so many investors who've indicated that they are willing to invest. And I'm thinking, although he's done it for completely different motives, but Sir Peter Vardy and his Emmanuel Schools, the investment he's made, although he, I think he gave those schools back to the state because he's just a wonderful man and he was trying to prove that you can turn around communities through um, creating these kinds of schools. But it would be interesting to know, maybe there's a billion pounds out there in the United Kingdom of investors' money that would go in and that would start to, I think, change the argument if you could identify the capital which would do that. So has that ever been done? And it just occurred to me as well given that we're, all, we're looking for growth in the economy and so forth, <clears throat> from the kind of entrepreneurial space that I operate in, one of the reasons I think for the profit motive is that we turn what is a cost center to society, public services, into a revenue line. If we allowed the kind of UK's entrepreneurs to go crazy in the educational center space, that becomes top line revenue, that becomes GDP, it becomes revenue rather than cost. Just in front of you. Um, Kevin Rooney, uh, Institute of Ideas Education Forum, uh, teacher at the biggest comprehensive in Hertfordshire, uh, head of social science there. I have a real dilemma on this question because I accept all the criticisms of the comprehensives. I, I take them fully. And I believe in freedom and autonomy. But at the same time, I really worry about the idea of left to sink and swim. Did you have a situation where Capitalist entrepreneurs will come in and take the rich pickings, and those at the bottom of the pie will be left behind. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. But the thing that really stuck in my mind, I thought it was a great talk, was the picture of the teacher sleeping on the table. It's absolutely got me, now it's going to stick with me for life. And the question I have for you uh, relates to Legrand's Knights and Knaves discussion. <coughs> See, my theory of human nature is, believe it or not, that we're social animals. And I'm a teacher, and I'm on about 40, 45 grand a year, and I've had a few opportunities to get nearly twice that amount of a wage. But I'm there because I have a spirit of public service and vocation and sense of altruism. And I want to ask you a question. Bottom line, what do you think motivates people in education? Do you think it's a spirit of public service, or do you think it's the profit motive? Is this on, this microphone? Uh, I'm Terry Arthur, I'm a financial uh, regulator um, at the IEA. Um, just a, a couple of points. One, one is a, a straight 
a question. Um, I seem to remember from a long, long time ago uh, when one's talking about the Newcastle Commission and so on, which started the 1870 um, ball rolling. I seem to remember there was a, another a set of statistics from Manchester, which was a much inferior, as I understand it, a much inferior uh, set of statistics, and that was pushed forward uh, before the 1870 uh, arrangement. Um, the other one is question, uh, well, sorry, a, a suggestion about the profit, uh, your list of things that uh, profit helped with or, or didn't. Um, I think one of them must be um, that net, uh, any net profit in an enterprise where all the participants are voluntarily acting, uh, that net profit represents new wealth. Um, and similarly, uh, a loss represents a loss of wealth. I think that has to be the case, provided every participant along the way um, is actually um, acting in a voluntary manner. James, if you can be relatively succinct in your responses, I'll try and get one or two more questions. Right. So more succinct than I've been, is that the... <laughs> <laughs> I don't like being succinct. Um, some great questions. Julie, um, so Peter Varley, I didn't know he'd given away his schools back to the state. I, I hope he hasn't given these academies away. That would be a distressing thing if he had. But ha has anyone quantified it in the UK, the, you know, what is the size of this industry? I don't know the figure. All I know is that most of my work is internationally at the moment. I know someone has quantified the, um, the upper end of the private market internationally for British high-end private schools at £30 billion. And my estimate is that the low-end market could also be a market of similar size, £30 billion worldwide. These are huge markets. You're absolutely right. Um, and there are people now, interestingly, thinking about how do we do precisely what you said? How do we enliven the entrepreneurial spirit and education amongst those people in Britain who are looking to go outside to invest? We could you know, certainly do something in this country too, I think. So that's a good point, but I don't know the answer. I'd be very interested if anyone else knows what the size of the market is here. I imagine it's huge. Um, in, in terms of, uh, yeah, in, in Institute of Ideas, Comprehensives, I, I should actually have given a disclaimer at the beginning. I was. Also, I was a victim of a comprehensive school myself um, way back. It was, a, it was a nightmare. I, I hated every minute of it, and I would never, ever want anyone to go through a comprehensive school like I did in, 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 um, in uh, East Bristol. Um, you, you don't like them, but you, you're, you're worried about the left to sink or swim idea, people being left on the, people left on the pile, left behind, and what motivates people in education. Um, I mean, you get people left behind in the state system. That's, that's the first thing. So that guarantee idea that we spoke about earlier, you don't get a guarantee in the state system. You get people left behind. But what you get in the state system is people left behind in sink schools, schools that acquiesce in mediocrity, are not allowed to be, if you like, taken over, closed, take, but taken over. Ch children are not allowed to be liberated in something better. So. That's the sort of, you know, the, the piece of the argument that, in a sense, you, I didn't express clearly enough, that people will not be left behind if the profit motive is allowed to come into education to serve all children. You will not get those children left behind in those sink schools. That's a, that's a, a longer argument. The motives of people, some people work in education for good motives like you do. Some people are, come into it, into schooling for a whole different range of motives. All I'm saying is that let's not be sniffy about the profit motive just because we don't like the sound of the profit motive. I don't like the sound of the profit motive. Some of the worst people I know are businessmen who just are concerned with profits and investors are concerned with profits. You know, I don't like those people. But remember, it's not the profit motive that counts. It's the outcomes of profit. And my argument, at least, is that they are beneficial in education, particularly for those who might otherwise be left at the bottom of the pile. That's, that's the argument in brief. And finally, I'm not being brief, I know, but um, uh, Terry. Um, oh, yes, so, so the, you, you mentioned the evidence from Manchester, and it was also Manchester, Liverpool, and a couple of other places. Actually, um, that was demolished when Foster brought it to the House, or at least was, the weakness was shown to, of that evidence. He, he said that was about, I think, about a quarter of the children in Manchester 
were not in school. That was the evidence he presented from Manchester. But there was a fiddle with the school leaving age. What the Newcastle Commission found, remember, was that for nearly six years, children were in school. So in other words, the school age was five to 11. In Victorian England, it was a poor country. But that Manchester evidence said the school leaving age was 14. Or, you know, school age people were five to 14. And so they then looked at all those 12, 13, and 14 year olds, and they said they're out of school, so therefore they count against the system. Now, that's a fiddle. That's a fiddle. You could do the same now. You could say, actually, state education only serves 70% of the population. Why? Well, the school age should be, leaving age should be 21. And look, children, most children between 16 and 21 are not in school. It's a fiddle. We could do it. But actually, it's a good, good way of uh, countering the state education argument, isn't it? It doesn't cater for the majority of people or, or the, everyone. So, yeah, it's a fiddle. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take, um, I'll take just a, uh, three more very quick questions. There's the gentleman on the far side there, the gentleman on the aisle in the white shirt has been waiting for some time to get in, and I'll finish with Philip Booth, our editorial director. You can be really, um, you can be really succinct, uh, that would be great, because we've got the clock against us now, so. Right, um, just to say, ex-comprehensive um, teacher who wasn't sacked, policy officer now, and a local politician, so just sort of put that out from the start. No, no one is perfect, sir. <laughs> there has been a rumour spread around by a lot of people, um, particularly, I think, on both left and right, that local authorities were in control of schools, speaking as a chair of governors representing a local authority and now having a brief for equality and social inclusion. I don't think we've ever controlled schools. What have actually been happening, governments of left and right have used a certain building not too far away to actually be quite interventionist from the centre and innovating, um, innovative curriculum projects were the features of some comprehensives that I taught in. I think that innovation is possible. I'm just interested, because you want me to be brief, you said one of the uh, benefits of the so-called diversity argument would be, including profit motive, would be for inclusion. Would that include looked after children? I'm a corporate parent of 700 uh, looked after children. Would it include special educational needs? Would it include all those? some of the more difficult issues, both financially and socially. Thank you. Hi there, uh, my name is Anthony Sutcliffe. Um, you say that the profit motive is the best way of achieving the right outcomes in education, uh, provided that the structures are right. Uh, and these structures are presumably key to achieving what it is that you want to achieve. Um, if one supposes that the the way forward to get the profit motive into the education system is via the system that Nick Clegg explicitly ruled out with free schools uh, run by people who can make a profit. Um, and doesn't it look a little bit like the PFI system where the government is creating structures that it has no idea how to create and gets rings run around it and we get awful results? Um, yes, this question to some extent follows on from that question. You mentioned that um, Eddie West was rather sceptical of, of vouchers, as, as you are, and I just wondered, wanted to probe you a bit further on the current policy environment, and do you think it would be helpful if the government um, allowed free schools to be profit-making schools, or do you think that will just create a sort of private sector in name only, which was then controlled by the government? Okay. So this is the end. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> They're working me for my supper tonight. Um, yeah. I mean, the first question. Th there's a lot of evidence of how, how the private sector can cater for special educational needs uh, and other um, special categories of children that y that you mentioned. That obviously, if we're talking about a purely private system, there has to be some money somewhere, but that can come through philanthropy, it could, you know, some people might argue, come from targeted assistance to those particular children in need. But I, what, what I'm reluctant to do, so I think there is an argument that the private sector can cater for the children you described, but what I'm reluctant to do is to say that those problems therefore lead us to say we need a universal state education for everyone. You know, problem cases don't make for the, make for the, the law for everyone. Um, you don't need universal state education because one or two or a small minority might need special assistance. Secondly, um, 
the, the discussion of structures was there. Now that's absolutely important. Uh, you know, PFI, uh, I read the evidence, I mean, I read the descriptions of what's been going on, it doesn't sound too happy a situation. Um, a private monopoly granted to one or two providers in state education would probably be, be a disaster. That's what we were talking about. That's why I mentioned structures in passing. You've got to get the structures right. You've got to allow competition. You've got to allow um, easy, you know, no reduced barriers to entry in all these other areas. So going on to Philip's question, you know, I, I, I didn't point to solutions very much because like Eddie West in the end, I am really skeptical about the way forward for government to reform education. And, you know, I, 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 I am denied whether to include this in my talk in the end, you know, dropped a few slides. But I actually believe change will not come through politicians saying, you know, this is the way you know, we're going to introduce vouchers or whatever. I think change will come through entrepreneurs creating very low-cost provision, probably outside of this country, in some of those new superpowers, India and China, and offering those services here. Imagine if an Indian entrepreneur, Indian company, comes and offers to children here or in America, we can educate your child better than the state system can, and it's gonna cost 500 pounds a year. There'll be huge demand, and then there'll be demand for vouchers or whatever, or reduced taxation, then the politicians will follow demand. I'm not sure it's going to come before that. So you, in specifically, and to close, would the free schools policy, the academies, be better if profit was allowed or not? It's possible it might be worse. It's possible it might be worse if you had one or two providers who were there and they went massively wrong and they put back the cause for a long time. If you had, if you followed Catherine's ifs and got the market right, and you allowed the profit motive in, then we could celebrate its arrival. If it's so heavily constrained, then I am reluctant to sort of jump on the bandwagon and say, let's bring it in. So in conclusion, the profit motive in education lessons for the British government, just watch your backs. <laughs> Change is gonna happen. Whether you like it or not. Before I just thank James, if I could just thank all of you for, for coming, and particularly those of you who contributed questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody uh, who wanted to ask uh, James a question. You might be able to uh, bend his ear in for a few minutes before he have to, has to dash over to supper. But thank you. And I remind you, if you'd like to be kept up with the Institute of Economic Affairs work and receive our uh, monthly newsletter by email, if you don't receive it already, please leave your contact details on the registration desk uh, at the back. It just remains for me to thank Professor Tooley for what was, I think, not just a fascinating and challenging uh, overview of education in this EG West Memorial Lecture, but also a thoroughly inspiring one. James, many thanks indeed.